Hi, I'm Carrie Conti, and I'd like to thank the organizers of the Artists at Your Conference for the opportunity to present some of the projects that I'm engaging in as Director of Programs and Exhibitions at the International Studio and Curatorial Program. IACP is a nonprofit residency based arts institution in Brooklyn, New York, which runs New York's most comprehensive international residency program, in addition to organizing exhibitions, offsite projects, public programs, and publications. IACP is an artist centric institution above all else, and we support the creative development of artists and curators and collaborate closely with artists, often over long periods of time. My curatorial vision for IACP's programming is in part defined by bringing to New York City practices and ideas that are absent from its cultural landscape or underrepresented, and to produce knowledge and discourse around international contemporary art practices. Often these initiatives focus on work that is socially or politically engaged, uh, and we present and commission work both in the public realm and in our exhibition spaces in our building. And I'll speak about some of these projects a bit later. At IACP, we host nearly 100 artists and curators every year from all over the world. And since our founding in 1994, we have worked with artists and curators from 60 countries. And so we are strongly committed to cultural exchange, especially now during the current political climate in the United States and around the world where conservative and oppressive ideologies have taken center stage. Put simply, it is more important now than ever to break down walls and barriers and to engender cross-cultural discourse. In this regard, we also work hard to provide residence, residencies for artists and curators from underfunded and underrepresented countries and regions. And residents are at IACP for three to 12 months. During this time, uh, they have studio spaces in our 20,000 square foot building, which is a former factory. So literally 40 artists and curators work alongside each other every day, which leads to a lot of incredible collaborations. Uh, they also have access to a lot of uh, programs when they're here. They meet with critics and writers and each have an advisor from the New York art community. Uh, they participate in artist talks and open studios. We visit art institutions and museums together. Um, and there are countless other community building initiatives. We've had quite a few socially engaged artists and residents at IACP. The Astor Gates and Marinella Senatore are, are just a few. Um, and our public programming, which is free and accessible to all, really dovetails our mission. Uh, we commission and present the work of both residents and non-residents in our public programming. Uh, so IACP is located at the cross-section of several neighborhoods where arguably more artists live and work than any other area in New York City. This area has long-term and engaged communities who were here long before the artists, and we've often organized projects outside of our physical building in places such as local markets, community gardens, advocacy nonprofits, and other public spaces with our neighbors very much in mind. We also have a dedicated staff member who builds relationships outside of the arts in our community. So when an artist wants to work with groups or individuals outside of traditional art structures, IACP can facilitate these connections in a very thoughtful uh, and sustained way. This year, in 2017, we've already presented several projects that address significant political and social questions. Uh, recently, on a billboard in Midtown Manhattan, transgender artist Martin Gutierrez has taken control of her own exploitation through a self-portrait that's very charged, uh, which kind of unravels gender politics and the public gaze and positions herself as both a product and consumer. The artist Fran Illich has a project up now called Arito America Winter Plan, and that continues a collaboration that we've had for several years with Los Soros which is an affordable housing organization in the rapidly gentrified neighborhood of Williamsburg. Uh, Illich has turned a storefront space uh, here into a neighborhood coffee co-op and community resource with its own microeconomy. Now in view at IACP is a solo exhibition by French-Iranian artist Gazelle. It's called Mismappings, 
and it deals with issues around migration, exile, transnational identities, and displacement. And this exhibition opened right in the midst of the US travel ban, and so it raises many pertinent uh, issues that are at the forefront of discussion right now. So here in the United States, as in much of the world at present, we're fighting for social and political change on many levels. Many urgent issues, just to name a few, such as labor conditions, migration, immigration, climate change, justice, inequality in all of its forms, civil and gender rights, are all giving rise to widespread political participation unforeseen in recent years. These are troubling times indeed, although I am hopeful by the numerous forms of protests and resistance that have emerged in the last months. Artists in general are often at the forefront of this resistance, and they have been very present in the last months in the United States, and artists provoke social change both through their art practices and as engaged citizens. It's pertinent to think at this moment where what are the responsibilities and roles of artists in this era, or for that matter, workers, cultural workers or curators. I found it helpful to look again at the efforts of artists and art movements from the past who had advanced social struggles as a guide on how to move forward. To name a few widely divergent examples, the constructivists and the situationists both were in the service of collective social transformation. Bonnie Shirk's The Farm, which transforms a wasteland under an overpass in San Francisco into a community garden. The Guerrilla Girls' ongoing fight for equality for women in the art world. Video Freaks and other countercultural video collectives of the 1960s and 1970s. Grand Fury's direct action during the AIDS crisis, Tucumán Arte's exhibition in Buenos Aires that raised consciousness about deplorable living and working conditions, numerous street theater um, movements, the Art Workers Coalition, and of course, much of Mara Latterman Ukulele's work in the fields of maintenance art, feminism, and ecology. All of these movements and artists what they have in common is that they worked in some form outside of the white cube. Art that is tied only to art institutions can never be truly radical. Art confined to the fields of culture alone reinforces conservative economic and social conditions and existing power structures. The autonomy of art from the real world is a failed project. It should not exist only for museums and for the privileged few. The deinstitutionalization of art opens up the space for collective participation and action, and consequently for social change. It's in considering art and social change, there are a few broad categories of tax tactics that artists deploy in their practices, just not in a totalizing way, but to name a few direct action and participation as part and parcel of the artwork. And there's also work that speaks about issues without direct action, but to raise consciousness. I think both approaches are equally crucial. And to par paraphrase the words of Hans Hacke, information presented at the right time and right place um, can be very powerful and can affect the social fabric. Artists need to work in the social realm and to make their voices louder than ever. Remember that art and the very freedom of expression is threatened in times of oppression. And just yesterday, uh, the United States government announced their proposed new budget, which completely eliminates all federal funding for the arts. And this is a very small budget in the first place, which is quite minuscule compared to other government programs. I'd like to speak for the remaining few minutes about one particularly relevant project in the frame of two exhibitions, uh, which relates to this conference and ideas of social change. Uh, it's a project by the artist Dylan Gauthier that was included in an exhibition that I recently curated at ISCP titled Aqueous Earth. And this show brought together a group of international artists to think about the ecological crisis and specifically the degradation of water. A second exhibition that I don't have time to speak about called The Animal Mirror considered the complexity of non-human animals. And this was a sequel to the first exhibition, Aqueous Earth. 
So it thought about animals in the Anthropocene era and attempted uh, to decenter the human alongside how to live in a time when climate change, industrial farming, loss of biodiversity, overpopulation, and pollutant pollution threaten our very existence. And the exhibition also recognized that non-human animals are entwined with all ecological and environmental ideas and concerns. Both exhibitions share a catalog since they have many overlapping concerns um, in that they posited art centrality and understanding, understanding and negotiating ecological shifts uh, and effects on human culture and society. So to return to the exhibition Aqueous Earth, it departs from Newtown Creek, which is a 3.8 mile long estuary, mere blocks from ISCP, where I'm facing right now. And it's one of 1,300 super fun sites, meaning that these places are um, defined by the Environmental Protection Agency as the most, most polluted places in the country and a special fund has been given to them to ensure their remediation. So many years of indifference on Newtown Creek has transformed it into an ecological catastrophe, beginning in the mid 19th century when oil refineries lining its bank let oil flow directly into the water and other industries along its banks, which produce things such as fertilizers, glues, um, and wastewaters ha have seeped right into the creek as a result of these industries. So Dylan Gauthier, as an urban wilderness explorer, um, was commissioned to produce a new work about Newtown Creek. He made a handmade boat, and the project uh, basically began with a boat building workshop at ISEP open to the public. Participants constructed a plywood boat to take on the creek, uh, which offered the possibility for the public, environmental activists, um, scholars, artists, to go on the creek with the artists to traverse the often overlooked English Kills branch of the creek, which is the most polluted. So on many mornings, uh, Gauthier took boaters, most of whom had never been on the creek before, despite it being in their backyard, uh, there to experience firsthand the effects of its environmental degradation and neglect. A video composed of these otherworldly moments, which were still and moving images, as well as excerpts from the early morning conversations on the water, was shown in the exhibition and updated as more boat rides occurred. Traveling on English kills is a very disorienting effect. Its waters are dark and laden with contaminants, and you cannot fully see anything, although the smell in the air is, is, very, um, uh, is very indicative of what is in the water. So the creek is completely stagnant aside from the, re uh, the release of contaminated sewage. It seems as though each meter of the creek is hosting its own microhabitat, fighting to adapt to its environments. While the typography of the shoreline is really shaped by scrapyards, wastelands, factories, overgrown swaths of wilderness, um, and many other very surreal sites, uh, reaching these places that are not ordinarily accessible allowed the participants in Gauthier's project a glimpse of the all-encompassing devastation. And while doing this, it off also offered the chance to reflect on possibilities for its future use and rehabilitation uh, while raising awareness of what's happening there and also providing the platform for very multidisciplinary conversations and reflection. So I'm gonna end there and I'm looking forward to hearing the responses and thank you very much.